Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisors of the Year. All right, folks, you're on the property. Good old calling on forever. You're on the property couch for each week. Ben and I bring you the insider's guide to Hello, property, mate. finance, and money management. Look at you up and about. Well, look, you know, third on the ladder. Finals time. Mate, you're third on the ladder. We're 14th and you're only one by nine points. Just get back in your in your, in your your box there. Do we Jack. want to go back a week to Geelong? <laughs> Do we need to go there? You've been waiting all week for this, haven't you? Well, I just, you know, look, what a week. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, look. You know, full confession, you and I went away for a week. We did. We come back, there's a new Prime Minister, the joint yeah. goes, the joint goes. Well, down. the good thing about that, though, Ben, is it's only three more Prime Ministers till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, um, but... Um, oh, crazy stuff. Yeah. Fair income. Like, you know, well, get your house in order. Now it's ScoMo. Yeah, ScoMo. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a better option for, for us. I'm, yeah. a, you know, I'm, I'm more, you know, middle yep. than don't like the... Conservatives too much, but oh, that's just my view. So we just defended the conservatives. Sorry, that's conservatives. Nice. Yep. It's like you know, I've got the f- yep. I've got an open view of the world. Exactly, but um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, interesting times in uh, Canberra, mate. Very interesting times. But what are we got on the show? Special guest today. Very, very special guest today, Ben. But before we get there, a couple of things. Yes, Pippa. Pippa. Yes, we've got a sentiment survey. I didn't think you'd throw that quickly to me, but thank you for I doing do. so. <laughs> Every year we do a sentiment survey to yeah. gauge the marketplace. Mm-hmm. In what's happening and so the sentiment survey is in the show notes we need you to tell us what you're thinking about the marketplace it's no point getting sentiment unless people tell you about no it. if we don't know we don't know and we don't know what we don't know until we know what we know when people tell us what they know <laughs> so it's really important to understand Push that. Seconds, maybe I can do that again. <laughs> but yeah so fill in the sentiment survey we'd love to hear your feedback it's one of Australia's largest property investment surveys so uh, please uh, get on board all right, thanks for that. Um, but uh, Property Buyer Expo as well, Ben. Property Buyers Expo. So at the Sydney International Convention Centre, ICC. Is that this the... is fun for me? What you yeah, you just throw it. You normally do this. Yeah, I know. That's like, why I was like, making it so I'm not going to write it down next time. Yeah, yeah. I only saw you. So mates. September yeah. seven, eight, nine. Uh, in Sydney. Sydney, so we'll be up there. Uh, We're basically. doing a talk on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. We are. For the firsties, so first if you're a firstie, you know someone who's a first time buyer, come along. Yeah, we're doing something on Saturday. And Sunday, mate, you've got your own gig, your uh, five properties five or less. Five property or less, how to retire with five properties or less. Yes. So all about the numbers, so yeah. we're doing a bit of a data dive. So if anyone hasn't seen that talk, Ben, it's worth going along, because you uh, it's not theory, you go, you, you dive in, you, show, yeah. you actually build it live. Well, that's the whole point. Yes, yes. you've got to show Build them. it live, live at uh, the Sydney uh, Expo, so come and check that at 1pm on the Sunday. Um, and there's a discount code, which we'll have in the show notes, Ivis, but... Um, Couch, Ben. Couch. Get a free ticket. Get a free ticket. Get several free tickets. Tell your friends about it. Come along. And the last thing is a data dive too. So we've had a data dive. That's been really popular, Ben. So we're going to make that available. Again, click in the show notes and you'll be able to check that out um, so that you can see um, what you've been up to in the the Capital Growth Lab. I've been in the Capital Growth Lab, so I'm looking forward to sharing people information around some of the growth areas and what's been happening and taking, lifting your eyes basically, taking a long-term view of the marketplace. I like that, Mm. lift your eyes. Okay, today, my Mindset Minute uh, theme today is uh, a concept that I was listening to Tony Robbins talk about, Ben. He talks about a decade and a day, Mm. all right? Mm. So some people spend sort of 10 years learning something, Yep. and then they write a book, Ben. Mm. And then you can, in a day, you can actually learn everything that they've done for the last 10 years in an afternoon through the value of the book. So, because then any person off the street can pick up the book, and then in that afternoon, they can just absorb um, what it takes, you know, yeah, maybe 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours, that's a good, I like it. So my, uh, my Mindset Minute theme today is a decade and a day, leaders are readers. And it's a beautiful segue, Ben, because uh, our book was the same. We, yes. Actually, our books yeah, seem well, to be our books. Soon, there's, the a decade, there's a decade out. in a day. Yes. Um, but today's guest is Andrew Mackey Smith. And he has written a book, Ben, called Building Success, Why Property Investors Need Building Inspections. Now... Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Cheers, Bryce. Now, Thanks, how man. do you feel about that? Uh, a decade and a day. It's what's taken you a very, very long time <laughs> to understand someone can get up to speed as quickly as you in one day. How do you feel about that? That's right. If you're a speed reader, 45,000 <laughs> words, if you can smash through it 
um, yeah, there's a lot of info, but it's all in bite-sized chunks. So. It, it is very framework-driven, but be, before we go into Ben, I just want to give everyone the backstory. Andrew sure. Baker Smith, he's a leading authority on building inspections. His extensive experience in building property inspecting investment has given him unique insight into the property inspection industry. Ben, Andrew is a licensed builder, a building inspector, and a pest inspector, and holds qualifications as a building surveyor, scaffolding inspector, Timber stores grader, you might have explained that one later. Yep. <laughs> uh, real estate sub agent and pest manager. Andrew is sought after speaker and has appeared on Selling Houses Australia. Is there any reason why you haven't appeared on my show? On well, I'm just waiting for the invite. Oh, <laughs> I better and check my asked. junk mail folder. <laughs> <laughs> it might be there. And a current affair to provide expert advice. In 2002, uh, Andrew and his lovely wife Trish, who's joined us in the studio, uh, founded Building Pro, specifically aimed at helping property investors. So you live in Brisbane with your two sons and you're a keen property investor yourself. You're well and truly qualified to talk about building success. There's more than a decade in a day there, I reckon. Yeah, 25 years, 25 years of experience. Tell us, tell us a little bit about um, the backstory. How did you get so involved um, in, in the property industry? Well, just indoctrinated from birth. Mm -hmm. uh, all the family are in building and property investing from the start. Mum and dad had a few properties they invested in and my, you know, my grandfather was a builder. My great-grandmother was actually an interior designer in Melbourne. So Nellie Nixon, bless her, she, she actually did the interior design for a uh, government house at the time. And she also did a lot of fine homes in Turak. Mm. And then my grandfather was a builder and he started a, the Mackey Group and they're still going, still going strong, still building. Mm. So it was just in my blood. I was always knocking together thin bits of carpentry and, and worked at Mitre 10 as a kid and you know, had to do all those errands around the building site. So, yeah. So just, when there was from the start. So Melbourne boy, born, born, born and raised in Frankston. Frankston. Uh, grew yep. up on the Mortington Peninsula. Yeah. Don't hold that against me. No, that's oh, right. that's uh, I'd be having to grow up on the Mortington yeah, Peninsula. It's a lovely, that. lovely yeah. spot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was. A, I even got to be a building inspector at Frankston Council for a couple of years, and I was a, worked at Melbourne City Council. So, yeah, yeah pretty familiar with with old Melbourne and. I was a supervisor on building some units at Turak. So yeah, spent the first 20 something years of my life here. And then the, the move up to the, the, the sun did you? Well, that was to be with my beautiful bride. Okay. Uh, so of course, yes. Um, <laughs> Trish is a, a Queensland girl, is she? Yeah, she's, yeah. she and I met uh, at the, yeah, we met in Brisbane and we ended up, we bought an investment property in Brizzy. Mm -hmm. um, we got some good capital growth on that one. Mm -hmm. That was in Paddo. And that was in 03, which was a very timely investment. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened after that was, um, yeah, I didn't realise, but kids were on the agenda next. So before we knew it, we had two kids. We jumped out of the rat race of Sydney, moved up there and then started our business. And that's, nice. that's history, 16 years. Now you've got experience uh, renovating, developing, you've bought and sold properties over a, over a career. Um, and, and you've landed in this building inspection space. Um, yeah. how, how did you, of all the sort of pies you could have put your finger in with property, how did you arrive at this destination? Yeah, good question. Well, you know, I was a project manager in Melbourne and then working in Sydney in property development uh, with Landcom. But when I got up to Brizzy, I actually didn't know anyone. Mm. Didn't have the extensive network and the family network of contacts. So uh, I took a part-time, I took like a temporary job doing inspections because I'd had experience in that. And it was actually really flexible and worked well for having a family. Mm. And I didn't have to work 100 hours a week mm. and I could have my weekends. Mm -hmm. So that suited a lifestyle. And then so we started doing inspections and just built it from there. And now we've got a, a great team and yeah, going strong. Beautiful. So in, in terms of from that, you've obviously got some great frameworks and some of the stuff we want to talk about today, sure. which is from the great book, um, is talking about some of the five steps to building success. So let's talk through those in terms of what you see are important in those five steps for anyone who's looking to, uh, to invest and looking at property as a physical asset. Sure. Look, I've cut the steps down to three. Oh, because oh. I, I think that you know people want brevity. They mm -hmm. want to give it to me now. Yeah, yeah, I want yeah. to know quickly. Five steps is too many. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'll give you, I'll give you the new three step. The version. new three oh, steps. The new look. three step version. If you're you're hearing it here first. first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an exclusive it. on the property couch. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Firstly, you know, check the property out yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of properties look good. They're all dressed up to look good. Yep. The fresh coat of paint, especially that you know the designer furniture. Um, all that can sort of sway people, the new kitchen, 
and uh, there's a plenty of DIY shows pushing the, the appearance, but you've really got to have a look at the substance of the building, what yep. you're looking at. And I've observed, and myself, I've gone along to property inspections, you, you rock up to the front door, you walk through, 15 minutes later you're out of there and you're making an offer. Yeah. You're feeling that pressure, especially mm. in heated markets. Yep. And people are making some pretty, what I think is rush decisions. Sure, you might have to put in an offer soon, but you do have a due diligence opportunity. And so I think the first step of the framework should be, you know, check the property out yourself. Mm. Walk around the building, have a look at the outside. That's where building inspectors find more issues. More people walk around the inside. My tip would be walk around the outside. Mm, great tip. Have a look at the land. Are you at the bottom of the street? Are you going to get overland flow? You know, those sorts of issues are important. And so yeah. do that first. Second tip, second step is get a professional building inspection. Don't skimp on this. Mm. It's when you deal with buyer's agents, they always get one. Mm. And why? Even their experts, they look at hundreds of properties, but you, you guys would always get one done, right? Absolutely. We, we don't pretend that we're, we're builders by any stretch of the imagination. Our job is to make sure they get the right location and then they get that one that stacks up for, a, for an investment from a numbers perspective. But um, whether, or not the, whether or not the building has the footings are shot or, you know, we, I, I guess from a buyer's owner's perspective, we, we know the, the basics and we can walk around and we can make sure that we don't get someone to do, get a building inspection when we know you know, from seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of properties that, hey, you're just going to waste some money. But if, we, if we're genuinely interested in, in a property, we don't sort of say it's an insurance policy. You, you know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very cheap way to make sure you don't make an expensive mistake. 100%. And thanks, thanks for saying that. But going back to the first point, having that initial walk around, because I've actually pulled up at jobs, got out of my truck, gone on and had a walk around the side of the building. I'm not there two minutes and I've seen a crack I'm not exaggerating, you can put your hand into this crack, it's the full height of the building. I said, uh, excuse me, John, come and have a look at this. We, we look and I say, see this, he says, mate, let's go, mm. back in the car, finish mm. it off, I'm not buying it. Mm. Yeah. Now, how easy would it have been to walk around and see that? Or how easy would it be when they find out later that um, there's a sewer line running through the back and that's gonna put a kibosh on their development. So doing that sort of bit of due diligence first, doing their own inspection, and that's first, then get a proper inspector out there and spend the money. Then after that, I, I also advise use a buyer's agent. If you can't get there yourself, use a buyer's agent. I've really seen the value of that and seen how buyer's agents do tend to buy better properties. Well, that was one all, because I didn't plan for you to say that, you didn't plan for me to say it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 we're, we're, we're at one all, which is good. Hey, go on. No, go I was on. just gonna say, I mean, you know, point number two was get a building inspection done. So who are the people that should get building inspections done? It's pretty straightforward, but you know, for the novice well, who are listening, well, a lot of, look, a lot of people, interestingly, they'll just jump online, as you do, you Google, what, what do you do when you want to find something? You just Google it, right? So people jump online and they'll think, okay, how much do these things cost? First thing that pops up is a really cheap price. Mm. Just, just take it back a step and use some common sense. If someone is price focused in their advertising, they're obviously are probably inexperienced and they probably just got a business model that's churn out a lot, a lot of jobs. They don't have time to talk people through things. Getting a building report is really only just the first step. The third part, the third step in the framework is actually understanding what that inspection result is yeah. and how, how do you use that to your advantage? Because mm. a lot of people are told, you've got to get a building and pest so they get one done, but then that's it. Oh, tick, done that. Mm. But what about actually understanding it? What about actually using the information in it? And we want to we want to take a deeper dive into the interior and the exterior points yeah, that you sure. go through that. So, I mean, who needs one? I mean, anyone who's buying a property. So whether you're owner occupier, whether you're maintaining your existing property or you're an investor, that's what you talk about in the book. It's pretty much anyone, it's a massive investment. It's one of the biggest things you're gonna put money on the table for. So you've got to make sure it's a it stacks up in terms of its physical structure. Obviously the land, that holds most of the value. Uh, but you know, in terms of how long is this asset going to be maintained? How long is it going to be reliable and durable for my tenants to be in there or for me living in there? And what, what other things do I need to do in terms of prevention as opposed to cure? Exactly. Thanks for answering your own question for me. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. This is when, when people are looking to engage an inspector, certainly choose someone with experience because what I've learned is what I knew, what I thought I knew when I started and what I knew after like 10 years is very different. Yeah, okay. So really getting someone with a lot of experience is important. If there's a license and available in the state that your territory you're buying in, that's good. And try and get someone with insurance because sometimes accidents happen. Mm. 
So we're doing a walk around. So we do do the mm. walk around first. Step number two is basically get an inspection done. Get one done. And step number three is interpreting that inspection. And I think that's where we want to take, we want to unpack that sure. you know, for the listener because that's probably where the gold lives in terms of that information. So take us through. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I, I, one of the things I think that is important for someone to look for in a building inspector is someone who's got experience, yep. someone who knows what they're doing, who can provide you with a report. But as I think you hit the nail on the head, and I don't know your business model intimately, but you've got to be able to have a conversation with the person who's done the building inspection afterwards. Because here's the deal. I get, I get that from a building inspection point of view, you've got to be conservative on the report mm. in writing, right? So you've got to make sure that you give enough information to the client, but also don't open yourself up to liability. And I totally get that, and that makes mm. sense. But you want, to, you want to be able to have someone help you interpret verbally what's on paper because sure you you might highlight some cracks but there are cracks that you would proceed with and there are cracks that you won't proceed with but to the to the person who is um untrained at this they just see crack and they just run a a million miles an hour and that could just be a a barrier that once they talk to you and you go here's the deal right if you were to pay ten thousand dollars and get it restumped that would be fine or whatever whatever your diagnosis is that just gives people a level of comfort to know okay I know what I'm in for here. I know that it's going to cost me ten thousand dollars. I know that I'm getting it for a, you know twenty grand cheaper than one around the corner. I do the maths and it makes sense, and it's not going to be a big effort. Versus where the footings are shot, you've got to drop a wall. There's scaffolding that needs to come in, you need to underpin all those sorts of things. It's like you don't need that as an investor. So I think the ability to have a conversation mm. with someone afterwards, I think, is critical when you're choosing someone to inspect. Yeah, yeah, couldn't have said it better. That is awesome. You definitely need to schedule a chat with the inspector Mm -hmm. and that's so critical to the understanding because I've read a few other reports in my time. We turn up now and do a lot of second opinion inspections where someone will come along and say the sellers provided us with a report but we don't really get it Mm. and that's because they haven't talked to the inspector Mm. and you see one item will say you know a fence needs repair well some fences are just a timber fence that could be a hundred dollars a meter to replace others could be a brick fence or concrete block fence that's a retaining wall, yeah. it could be $40,000. So it can be very different, repair, replace a fence mm. on mm. one property to the next. But you don't get that from a report without talking to the inspector, so 100%. The way, the, the way that we coach our clients through that is you get the results from a, a building inspector that we, we're looking for major and minor. So we go straight away to major, all right? And it, major, essentially, is it gonna fall over or is it being eaten by two mites? They're you know, breaking it down to its, its simplest, yeah. those two things. Once, we've, once we're happy that we've checked those two things off, we then go to miners and they're not, they're not deal breakers. They're, they're actually one of two things. They're one, at best, they're a negotiating point to get the price down, or two, you've just been given a maintenance list so that you yeah. know over time what you've got to fix. But you're not buying a perfect asset. Even if you go and buy a brand new property, there's red dots all over the joint. Like they're, never, they're never blemish free. Um, so as Greville perhaps says, you just compare apples for apples and just compare the bruises, you know, so it's effectively having a look at the bruises. But um, is that how you would sort of coach yeah. client through it? Yeah. And interesting, you make that point about new homes. Um, a lot of builders will be trying to guide a potential purchaser not to get an inspection. And that's because they don't want the trouble. Mm. They don't want us, us pesky inspectors coming in and finding issues that are hard to fix. Mm. So they're happy to walk you through quickly and say, oh, pick up any paint defects or wobbly door handles. We'll fix that. No problem. Because yeah. that's a five yeah. minute fix. But finding that the patio doesn't have any drainage or something really major, they don't want you to pick up on that. Mm. So. Yeah, it is good to have an inspection on you. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's take a deep dive into um, some of the, you know, you've got a great list of 16 points on exterior and interior. I've got 11 points there. Let's sort of talk a f- a f- uh, through the most common ones, starting with the exterior. Exterior. What is? What are some of the things that are, that are uh, deal breakers for you or some of the things that you might want to uh, sort of look at in more detail and have that conversation with your potential client? Yeah, sure, Ben. Well, look, as an inspector and a property investor, when I pull up at a property, the first thing I look at is where is this property situated? Is it on the top of a hill and then it's going to get wind, right, like a high wind issue? Yep. Is it at the bottom of a hill where it's going to cop all the, all the runoff and drainage? Does it back onto a creek? Is it low-lying, say, where I'm from in Brisbane? Mm-hmm. If it's near the river, mm-hmm. it's likely of two things. It's going to be flood-prone or the land could be more reactive soil type. 
Yeah. Right, so you can get more cracks and movement yeah. in those issues. Yeah. So I have a look at where is the property situated, high, low, whatever, flat backyard. So you look at the topography, drainage is really important on a property. Sometimes I feel like I'm a water inspector mm -hmm. because water can do all sorts of ills. Water can make, by making a property damp, you can get mold, it can attract uh, fungal decay, which is rot and yeah. termites. But also poor drainage. You know, you walk into a house and you get that good feeling, mm -hmm. it's, it's light, it's airy, it's dry. That's because it's dry. Mm. And when you get a damp house and it feels all dark and damp, that doesn't feel right. That's because that's the right conditions for all the pests and issues. Mm. So essentially drainage becomes very important. So I'd say to anyone, when you pull up, have a look at the topography. The land should slope away. There should be drains around the house. Be wary of houses built into a hill. If you have that warning sign because you're going to have retaining walls, mm -hmm. which you've got to check the Costly. condition very carefully. And remember what I said about people rocking up to the front door and just going through the house. Yeah. If you're on a sloping site, look at the boundaries, look at the retaining walls. They can be very costly. The other thing is when you look at the house, have a look if it's built into a hill. Because if you've got walls below ground level, I'll tell you what, the risk of the mm. dampness penetrating yeah. through those walls is very high. Mm. So always be aware of that. And remember, people can patch and paint over that and make it look good. Yeah, Because you'd be really experienced in that, because you don't get that a lot in uh, you know, in Melbourne, because it's a reasonably flat topography. It but is. you go to the north side of Brisbane, it's like... It, it's, it's hilly. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. every day for you. It, it Look, it is. And I mean, still, still in Melbourne, I noticed that a lot of their older... Uh, federation style buildings and things uh, with timber floors are built very close to the ground mm -hmm. and so that can have issues of ventilation and yep. rot and other things so mm -hmm. it's certainly about still yeah topography is important uh, drainage less so perhaps in Melbourne and where you've got sandy soils at the coast but another thing is when you start at the street if you buy any property within about a kilometre or so of the sea see I grew up in Frankston on the near the beach there you've got to be very careful buying a property near the beach because what, what happens is you've got all the metal components can rust. Sea mist. Yep. And that, that salt-laden atmosphere, anything within a kilometre of the sea, you're supposed to have stainless steel fittings on a lot of things. Mm. So I've gone to properties in, in Frankston by the water, pushed the walls, and they've actually on brick veneer house, and the whole brick wall wobbles. <laughs> and the reason is it, the brick ties have all rust, rusted out. And then you get steel lintels over openings, yep. and they've been all rusted out too. And then owners will do sneaky things like box over them with a bit of cement sheet and render or something. Mm -hmm. And so just realise that steel lintels, steel components, it'll even rust out aluminium mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, anything near the beach, watch out for rust. So which, I mean, you were just talking some of the structural challenges with those types of things. How, how does a novice person look at a property structurally and make determinations. They really can't, but what, what, you know, when you're doing that walk around, what are you looking for? You're looking for leaning and yeah. angles. Yeah, just, just use, just stand, stand at each sort of um, elevation. So you've got the front of the building and just stand there and just pause for a moment and just take in the, take in the building and, and does it sit square and level? Most mm. of us can see if things are level or not. Mm. Have a good look and look if the building looks square and level. Are all those door openings square? And when you uh, have a look at that from the outside, is the, if the building's on the lean, get back in the car. Yeah, it's probably yeah, it's yeah. not a good sign, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's a big problem. Yeah. So have a look at that. Is, does it look level and square? Stand back and have a look at the roof. If it's, if it's a metal roof, is it rusting, mm. right? Can you see rust? Uh, if it's a tiled roof, can you see that bedding and pointing falling apart? The bowing is definitely the, a big the, thing I look for in the in the roof line. Certainly. But it's, it's for the it's for the novice to go. All right, where's the tolerance? Because no house is perfect. No house is like absolutely straight. No roof is absolutely perfect. It's probably what what what? How would you guide them to say, okay, this is these are your plus or minus five percent here, where you'd say, okay, still walk inside. Yeah, I think if you're a, well, I like that saying you said the firsty. I haven't heard that, but the first home buyer. Yeah. So if you're a firsty, bring along some experienced head. Bring along some grey hair with you. Bring yeah. along uncle who was a builder or a friend who's bought a few properties. Um, even mum and dad if they've owned a few houses, you yeah. know. Get them along and they will probably have a bit of judgment on that. Um, that's the first thing. And then take a photo with your phone. Make a note of those things. Um, and then with that, you can then bring that up with the inspector and say, oh, look, when I did the house, I did notice the damp spot on the ceiling in the bedroom and I noticed the roof's bowed a bit and there was a bit of a crack in the 
I was a bit worried about in the back wall. Can you mm. check those things mm. for me? Mm. Just do that. Because mm. that's what I, sorry Ben, you don't know, but that's, as a buyer's agent, I would always turn up, um, particularly early on in my career, I'd always turn up when the building inspector was there because I just want to accumulate more knowledge, accumulate more mm. knowledge, make yeah. sure I go, because I go, oh, I didn't see that. Oh, I didn't. And so now I can see a lot of the common stuff that before it was like just looking at a house and you think, all right, I'm, you know, like everyone else, you walk through and you get a, carried away by the emotion of what's internally, but now I, I tend to um, I tend to look externally more than internally now. Um, yeah. So one of the points you got here is paintwork. Now, obviously, to the naked eye, we can all quickly assess paintwork. But what is some of the other stuff that you would then pick up with your trained eye that that the most novice person is not going to pick up? Well, one thing is, look, older properties. If you're pre 1990, you've got to even it used to it used to be about you know, the 80s now, they're saying anything pre-1990 it can have a risk of lead paint. So lead paint on a repaint of a house can increase the cost up to $5,000 on a repaint. Mm. But one thing you've got to watch out for, for example, talking about paint, if, paint's, if paint is just faded and old and needs a repaint, it's a pretty straight up clean down and repaint. If you've got paint that's actually peeling, particularly on timber, that's very expensive to fix because mm. the painters have to scrape all that off, feather all the edges of that, and prepare the surface prior to painting. And if that's peeling and it's lead paint, that's a bit of a safety hazard for any young kids because mm. ingesting any flakes of lead paint is quite toxic for mm. them. Mm. So you, you need to have that removed. And the other thing with painting you've got to watch out for is the height. A lot of people look at these homes, like you might be out at Eltham Way in Melbourne mm -hmm. or somewhere, and it, mm -hmm. you get a, high, a taller home, say two storey or three storeys high. How are you going to reach? How are you going to reach it? I <laughs> go same to, with the Queenslanders, you yeah. know, where, they're, where they're up on stilts. Yeah. They're up on stilts, but yeah. you get a property that's on one of those gullies, like a sloping block, yeah. and you've got you're six metres, eight, ten metres up in the air. How are you going to get the scaffolding there and paint it? That could, add, that could double the cost of your paint job. Mm. So definitely look into that. So tell me about um, uh, the biggest one is what, what's, the, what's the amateur buyer, um, what advice can you give them about floors, you know, uh, stumps, uh, f f you know, leaning floors, how, do, how are they going to self-assess before the inspector comes in on whether they should um, get back in the car and move on to the next sure. one? Sure. Well, look on a concrete slab, um, again, have a, look, have a look on your doors. You know, when you go into, for your floors, that'll be... If your floor's out of level, you'll often pick that up with your doorways. Mm. So what happens is when the building moves, the door frame will distort. Mm -hmm. So if you just simply go and open and close the door to say a bedroom or whatever the room is, and have a look if you've got a gap at, the, at one end of the door, that's a pretty good indication. Or maybe they've shaved the top of the door to make it fit. That's a pretty good indication of movement. In a timber floor, you'll often see feel it's out of level. Mm. If you can feel it's out of level, it's probably significantly out of level. Mm -hmm. If you can, duck it, crouch down, have a look under the floor, and see if those what the condition of those stumps are. If you can see if they're concrete or they're timber, are they rotting? Are they cracking? Because that's going to be expensive. Veronica, who's the co-host of my television show, she just carries a marble with her. She just oh, drops, yeah. the, drops the marble on the floor. That's right, she's lost a few, so <laughs> she's got no right to reply on that one. Really, it's even better. Hey, I'm going on her podcast. You know, uh, well, make sure to listen to this before you go on. Um, so, sorry, just back, um, you talked about, you know, the paint flakes on weatherboard. Some people are just, I want brick and brick only, and other people, are, oh, I just want weatherboards and weatherboard only. What, yeah. what advice are you going to give to the, the people who are, you know, because if you're a swinger, that's all right, but what if they're staunchly brick and what are they up for and if they're staunchly for the boards and yeah. some of the blind spots on either? Yeah, look, good question. If a lot of people buy brick and they feel that's more solid and lower maintenance, I would tend to agree. Mm -hmm. It is lower maintenance, okay? One thing I would say to a lot of people see an old brick and they'll say, oh, it's that, you know, remember those chocolate ripple biscuits that used to be that colour and they'd get bricks that are that colour? People say, I don't want that 1970s Mission Brown brick. I'm going to render it. Mm. Now, if the building is solid and has very few cracks in it, it'll be a good candidate to render. But... A lot of cracks can't be seen because they're, they're inside the joints of the brickwork and mm. the joints are raked. But once you fill that up and render it, it's gonna, those cracks will reappear mm. and then your render will look bad mm. a year or two later when it all starts cracking up and then you've got to patch over it again. So my advice to you is be careful. If you buy a house with the intention of rendering, check very carefully for cracks. When it comes to, say, a timber home, they are higher maintenance. You need to budget for repainting about every 12 to 15 years. And it, and it can be substantial. Like out painting the outside of a Queenslander could be 30 grand. Mm. 
So pretty big cost. So if you're painting every 15 years, every two years, every year put away a couple of thousand for paint. It's interesting, I own both uh, weatherboard and brick uh, properties and the renovations on the brick properties are actually more expensive than what they are on the weatherboard property. Mm. So it's actually quite easy to knock back a lean to off the back and push out, a, you know, put a box on the back, right? But in terms True. of, you know, the brick work and knocking down a brick sort of facade and moving, it's just harder work. Internals, I've got a um, cow bungalow in Mooney Ponds and that, that was massive in terms of the cost of moving chimneys and a few other things because mm. it was, you know, that the place was built back in 1927 you know back in the time the kitchen was next to the fireplace and it had a little servery into the dining and so all of that had to go oh, it was very expensive whereas if that was all weatherboard you know it's just timber frame easy to move you know done in a day uh, certainly more challenging with uh, the brick that's look very true so from a maintenance point of view bricks lower maintenance yeah, from yeah. a renovation point of view <laughs> yeah. Definitely, the definitely the timber is so, easier. And that's why I don't, I don't spend too much time, you know, paralyzing myself in terms of saying whether brick or, or weatherboard is the way to go. It's just like, it's just hey, it stacks up. Yeah, is it, is it, is it yeah. attractive to look at? Has it got period charm? Has it got all those things yeah. that I'm looking for? If I've got all of that and, I, and I've got that under a power appeal, it's like, tick, mm. let's, let's look at, okay, I need to factor in maintenance. So, you know, we use 1.5% of the value of the property indexing at 3% each year. So sometimes you could be six years where you're not doing much other than small repairs, but then there's, all right, it's due for a paint. And, you know, I've just painted one in uh, Flemington and that was, you know, $9,000 for an external full paint job yeah. on a single fronted uh, Edwardian. So that's what you've got to be up for, but it's, that's the way it goes, you know, and I'd, I'd factored that in. I had just hadn't spent it. So it had been accumulating up, but then obviously the time is to, to maintain that. Mm, hey, another point. thing that comes up for property investors, um, Andrew, is you know, decks, balconies, verandas, yeah. uh, patios, stairs. Yeah. Um, what's, what's your feedback for what, what people should look for in any of those? Sure. Look, I, I personally think, you know, decks and verandas and balconies are great. They add a lot of um, appeal in terms of that outdoor living. Particularly, Especially, particularly in Brisbane. Partic <laughs> particularly in warmer climates like mm. Brisbane mm. And, and, say, Perth and other places. Mm. But... See what, what we have in there, Perth. Yeah, yeah. Perth <laughs> reference. Yeah. 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 Like throwing it in there yeah. for you. So, so the people live in Perth. <laughs> so, <that's where> <laughs> I always say to people, and uh, I can get away with this because I'm from Perth, but, but last time I was in, you know, went to Perth, I sort of flew out of Melbourne. It was about 12.30, I got on the flight, and then by the time I landed, it was 1987. <laughs> <laughs> Don't write me in, folks. Yeah, I'm from Perth. I'm from Perth. I get it. You I can get say it. that because yeah. you're from Perth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so those timber structures, again, being timber, they do require more maintenance, especially in climates where you do get a fair bit of rain like Brisbane. Mm. That will, if, if the tim once the timber breaks down, little cracks form in the timber, have a look closely for that because then the, the fungal spores float around, floating around will lodge in there and it starts rotting. Now you can get, rot can accelerate quite quickly. Within six months or a year, you can have timbers rotting. Mm. And instead of just a simple paint job, you've got to bring in the carpenter and replace quite a bit of timber and that ups the cost of your maintenance. So my tip is, if you're looking to buy a property, very much careful about properties that use pine timber, mm -hmm. even if it's treated pine, not yeah. a fan. Yeah. I much prefer hardwood because it will last a heck of a lot longer. Yeah. Okay, so That's certainly yep. pine handrails, yep. um, pine timbers, they will tend to rot out. Yeah. But uh, even the treated and preservative treated ones, often they're not treated well enough. Yep. I can so for that. hardwood is I'll a lot better choice, concrete's a lot better choice. Yep. So if you're looking at an investment, it's going to be higher maintenance, especially if you've got a property that's got a lot of walkways, verandas, decks and things like that. And then if you throw in the overhanging trees, mm. what happens? The trees block the light. The light can't get th past the tree to dry out the moisture from morning dew. Mm. And then the dew and the rain just drips off those trees continuously, keeping those decks damp and those walkways and things, and they will rot away very quickly. Mm. So trees near properties with lots of timber is a recipe for very high maintenance. What about some of these uh, new products which are sort of plastics and converted things for decks and all that type of stuff? Do you have any views on those types of finishes? I mean, they're obviously durable. I, I'm actually a big fan. Yep. When they first came out like artificial grass, I thought it looked like total plastic. Yeah. But they're, they're getting they're, better, aren't they? are getting better. Yeah. They look good. The colour ranges are nice and, and trendy. And I think they're actually awesome. It's like I'm a, a big vinyl fan. Floor, floorboards, which yeah. are getting better and better and better. Yeah, yeah vinyl plank. Love it. The, the other yeah. thing, too, is when, you, when you're when going on a deck or a balcony, it's having the height of the rail not 
to code. And it's it's funny you see that quite regularly. Or the um, uh, the individual, um, what are they called, uh, balustrades between each of the posts, there's too big a gap and kids can fall through it and those sorts of things. Obviously, that would be one yeah. one for you guys. But what, what do you see and what, what sort of advice do you give to people if you see um, the, the, the rails that are not to code? It's a, that's a great question, Bryce. Look, a lot of houses were built before 1975, before the Building Act came in. So prior to that, you could have handrails, even things built in the 90s would be, say, 90 centimetres high instead of the metre high. So the minimum requirement for a handrail is a metre high, mm -hmm. okay? You Australia need, wide or Brizzy? Uh, that's for Brisbane. Yep. It's gotta be 865 high on a side of some stairs mm -hmm. is the minimum height, a metre minimum height for a balcony handrail deck and the and landing. And then you've got the spacing of those rails 125 millimetres, mm. okay? The, the main concern around those is, is safety. And if you've got it, what, what comes into play is really you could have a house, if a house was built with a low handrail, say it's 900 millimetres high, but it was built 20 years ago, uh, back then it should have still complied with a metre, so it's still wrong and should be upgraded. If it was pre-1975, I would say that should be okay, mm. doesn't actually have to be that, that metre high. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say, but hold on, I'm just repairing what's here. Now, if you do a repair and you replace just a small section, uh -oh. you can put it to the height that it used to be, the old height. Oh, and okay. that's legal and acceptable. Okay. However, if you did about more than 20% of it, you should upgrade to the current code. So that applies to a lot of things. People don't know this with issues like roofing as well. Do you know if you replace, a, a put a new roof onto a house, you've got to improve all the tie downs and the bracing and those other things as well. Mm. And a lot of people omit that, even insurance companies. Mm. So just realize if you do more than about a 20% repair, mm. you're then substantially repairing it, you've got to bring it up to code. Mm, that's interesting. So we've Often done, overlooked. Yeah, it sounds good in terms of great advice. So what does that mean? That the insurance company will say, oh, you put a new roof on it, but you didn't do anything else and the roof blew off and so now we're not paying out the insurance claim. Well, that's, in fact, what I'm saying is some insurance companies get their builders to go out and actually re-roof houses after, say, Cyclone Debbie or yeah, Yazi yeah, or something, yeah. and they'll re-roof, but the, uh, the actual roofers don't go and get a carpenter to come in and put all the extra tie-downs and bracing uh, and triple grips and those sort of things that are required, yeah. and no one goes in to check. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that, I see that happens a lot. Okay. So just, just that 20% rule on a repair yep. is an is interesting thing to you know, to contemplate. So let's move from exterior into the interior. Let's go to where everyone goes, Ben, straight yeah, through the front door. That's, that's it. it. <laughs> that's what they do. Looking around the property, we've learned that earlier. <laughs> Let, let's get inside. And what are some of the, the, the glaring ones for you in terms of, you know, some of the challenges you've had and some of the, you know, the ones that really need to be addressed quickly? Well, look, a lot of houses have cracks and cracks can occur just for shrinkage. So a lot of people point to small, tiny hairline to millimetre wide cracks in cornices and mm. ceilings. That's often just shrinkage and yeah. nothing to worry about. We've got those what we call gull wing type cracks where it comes off a 45 degree angle above doors and windows, more of a concern. Mm. Okay? okay, You certainly want to be looking at those more closely, testing those doors like we said. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with picking up cracks but they won't look for gaps. So I'd suggest to you have a look at gaps between say the windows and the actual sort of uh, brickwork or wall, that yep. can be an issue. Yep. Yep. Um, inside, definitely check those ceilings and walls for leak stains, right? Um, classic thing, you just walk in and have, and have a look. If you see a brown tea coloured stain, that's usually a bit of a giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, I like to go to the wall behind the shower. Just, yeah. Just go and see if it's been recently painted or if there's been any signs of any deterioration um, typically there or um, wherever there's a wet area, I like to look at the walls behind. 100%, and like a leaking shower's at least $5,000 to pull it out and redo it. Um, there's a lot of companies around it running around doing these sort of um, tile grout type repairs mm, yeah. and charging, say, seven or $800. They're actually often just a bit of a Band-Aid, mm. and often you need to actually pull all the tiles out, re-waterproof to do it properly. Mm. So definitely, yes, check behind those, especially if the house is more than about 20 years old, often the, the uh, membranes can give way in that time. Other things, you know, if you're buying the property with the view that you're going to rent it out, it's going to be for lease to tenants, you need to be much more considerate of tenant safety and occupancy. Well, you might say, look, I'll put up with that. But for a tenant, 
If you've got glass windows and doors that could be a house built in the 60s, it may not, none of that may be safety glass. Mm. So you may want to consider putting some, some of that clear plastic film on there. You can have a glazier do that. It's going to be a lot cheaper mm. than just replacing, that, you know, yeah, replacing the safety tip. glass. Yep. And there is a landlord, it's going to reduce your liability. And maybe, yes, that handrail height could be worth just altering and putting an extra top rail on, not putting a whole new rail, but just put a, another rail at the top. Uh, so things like safety becomes a much bigger issue, I think, and things like you know paths on the way up to the house. But sorry, we're talking about the interior. Yep. But yeah, just just addressing safety hazards. Certainly, things like balustrading on stairs inside, uh, and things like windows being safe. Smoke detectors are really important. If you've got a rental property and you're still using battery powered, mm. just spend the money and swap it to yep. hardwired, interconnected, 100%. photoelectric, lithium battery backup. Yep. In each bedroom, it's coming, just do it. Yep. Do yep. it now and yep. have it safe. Mm -hmm. So that'd be my tip on that. But yeah, there's, there's certainly safety is becoming a lot more prevalent. And unfortunately, we are occasionally engaged by uh, solicitors uh, looking to build a case for a tenant who's fallen through a deck or who has, um, you know, claiming some compensation so. from a landlord. Mm -hmm. So just be aware that does happen. And the best way to protect against that is to do up, keep your maintenance yeah. up. Yeah. And typically these don't be a the, slumlord. Yep. Typically the slumlords have been told two or three times from the from the property manager, "Hey, this is an issue. We've got a problem with the deck. It's rotting boards," and they just ignore it. Yeah. And then they wonder why they're getting sued a bit later. And obviously, when we're walking through a property, we don't take our ladder with us, and so we no. normally don't go into the manhole and take a peek in the roof. Um, what are some of the things that you're looking for up in that roof area uh, that will that will sort of indicate concern for you? Yeah, because people can't do that at an inspection. What you can look for is the is the sagging ceiling. So stand back and have a look at that ceiling and sit, mm. check if it's actually undulating and sagging. That can be an indication that the plasterboards let go or so forth. You can also check for leak stains that could indicate the roof needs replacing. Um, what I check for is we check the structure, obviously, the tie downs, if it's been re-roofed. Uh, we'd also have a look for the presence or absence of insulation. Look at insulation clearances from light fittings and things where the rats have, even though a building inspector doesn't do, uh, say, a check on yes, electrical wiring, electrical, yeah. but you, you would have a look for things like if rats have chewed through wiring or, or there's other issues. Yep. So yeah, those are the basic structural things you're looking for and pest issues like termite damage. Yep. But if you, from your own inspection as a pre, as a, you know, initial inspection prior to your professional inspection, have a look for the sagging ceilings and the stains and, and the roof dips that you can see outside in the roof line. And what are some of the tools of the trade? You, I mean, we know you go in with certain meters and cameras. Tell us a little bit about those because not too many people would know about some of the tools of your trade. Sure. Mm. Well, look, some, some of the tools are good. And some are and some are actually a bit of marketing. Okay. Right so I've yeah. got to be honest with you. Yeah, there's yeah. one there's one that's very popular <laughs> in our industry called the thermal camera. Okay. Look, I bought one because I got sick of people asking me if I had one. Yeah. So I bought one <laughs> just so that I could say, yes, we have a thermal camera. Yeah. Do I use it? Yes, we do. And it is a useful tool, yeah. but it's not a silver bullet. It's not magic. Yeah. You yeah. can't just, otherwise I said to people, you'd, you'd hire one at Bunnings mm -hmm. and bring it home and just find have the termites yeah, yeah, yeah. do it yourself. It'd be that easy, wouldn't it? You'd have an iPhone app. But... It's not like that. Those were made for the electrical industry to find heat uh, from, from wiring, faulty wiring. They have been applied to the pest industry. They will pick up a large wet spot or hot spot uh, that could indicate, say, a very significant termite infestation, but a single lead of termites coming up, they will not find. No. <laughs> and once the termites have been poisoned and, and gone or have left, they will not find any old damage. So you could have entire walls Correct. eaten out yeah. and that thermal camera cannot find it. So mm. when you hear claims made by inspection companies in some of their literature and websites, I cringe when I read, we can see inside walls, because yeah. that is BS. Yeah. Mm. They can't see inside walls, mm. okay? So be skeptical on that. There, there are other um, tools we use. Uh, we use one called uh, Termatrack, which yeah. uses like a sonar type of device and that will detect movement. Yep. 
but the area it can scan is about the size of a matchbox. Yeah, okay. So imagine, people say, can you do the scan on the whole house? Sure. Can you imagine <laughs> yeah. moving a matchbox in time? <laughs> let, let me show you the quote. <laughs> <laughs> we can do anything at yeah. a price. It yeah. costs 20 grand. So, yeah. well, exactly. So what we have to do first is a visual inspection is the best way, yeah. followed by tapping with the stick, which mm. is primitive, but really works yeah. still, because yeah. yeah. uh, that can find old damage. And then you use the moisture meter all the way around, mm. and then you follow up with the Termotrack and thermal camera at the end if you've got any moist yeah. spots and suspect areas. Great tools, the great tips there in terms of some of the little tools of the trade. I agree, Ben. The last one for me on the internal is um, what's, the, what's the first thing you do when you walk into the kitchen, the bathroom, the laundry, um, the toilets, what's the, you know, all the wet areas, what's the number one thing that you're looking for to make sure that it doesn't have this thing wrong with it? You know, I've got to be honest, you don't get too many problems with kitchens. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the, you throw out a kitchen before it wears out. It mm -hmm. dags out before it kind of wears out, doesn't <laughs> oh, it? You know I what like I mean? It dags out yeah, before it wears yeah, out. There we go. That's a good one. That's, have I coined a new one? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I've, heard of first yeah. I've got well. thirsty from you guys yeah. today. I'm going to buy that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you, you can see a 40-year-old kitchen that might typically open the cupboard under the sink because you're always going to probably find a bit of water damage. Yeah. The sink's leaked at some point. The yeah. the you know dishwasher hoses have disconnected and it's leaked. Mm -hmm. So there might be a bit of old water damage there. Um, termite damage in a kitchen, I've found it once. Like it's pretty rare. Okay. okay. Beyond the other structural things, kitchens again, they just dag out. Bathrooms, however, what you said before, Bryce is spot on. Mm. The the incidence of showers leaking, especially once the building gets some age, is very high. So be very wary of checking around showers for any damp or signs of, of leaks. Um, basically, leaks from those appliances is a big one. Other than that, there's not there's not heaps. Tiles, it, have a look have a look at the tiles. If they're cracking or if they're bulging, that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much going to have to pull them off and retile. All right, so here's the, here's the one for you. Okay, of all the knowledge you know, you're about you and your lovely wife are about to jump in the car this weekend, and you are going to buy an investment property, uh -huh. and you are going to look for these things. What are these things based on everything you know about building? Well, you know what? As a property investor, I'd have to say the first thing I'll be looking for would be walk score and proximity to town and Ooh, those sort location, of issues. Location, those eighty percent right, location. There you go. Love it. So I'd have to say of of yeah of swallowed the Kool-Aid on that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got to be location, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely location and walk score. Those things I think are more critical because you can change the building, you can fix things, you can even knock it down and rebuild. But the location, the land size, the proximity to amenity, I think that's still key, mm -hmm. right? But that being said, on the building, probably the most, you can fix it. People get really worried about termite damage. You get, most termite damage is actually more minor than what people think there's a bit of a scare campaign going along in the pest industry, which is self-serving to all those pest inspectors, mm. to talk it up and make you invest in a barrier. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, there's a big termite risk. And by the way, here's a quote for $5,000 and we can yep. sort that out for you. Yep. So I think there's a little bit of vested interest and some people talking up the fear. Where's the, where's the middle ground then? The bait look, boxes? As a, as a starting point? I prefer chemical treatment. Okay. Some properties don't uh, lend themselves well to that because yep. they're because of the way they're built and would be better for a bait boxing system. Yeah. But I think uh, a chemical treatment, and personally I'm a big fan of Fipronil, is, is an excellent chemical and, and I haven't seen that fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. All, just about every other system I've seen fail. So a big fan of Fipronil works very well. Um, the old organochlorines and organophosphates the farmers used to talk and boast about they got outlawed in 1995 because they were a bit too toxic yeah, <laughs> to yeah. have an afterlife of like yeah, nuclear, <laughs> something nuclear. <laughs> but definitely the uh, fipronil is excellent. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the main thing, it's probably building significant building movement like structural failure. What you talked about before, bro, subsidence like foundation failure, where you get the whole building out mm. of level and significant cracking, that's very expensive to fix. Mm. But you know, that's from a building point of view, but before Trish and I even got to that point of looking at the building, there's so much due diligence you can do online. So you want to find out, you know, is there a, if, if it's a development, potential development site and you want to do a battle axe and put, a, put another unit behind or something, is there a sewer line running through the middle? Is there, um, you know, is it flood prone in that area? Um, all those sort of things and tests and checks and balances you can do first before you even go there, do them first. You can do them from the comfort of 
you know, mm. your own home. If you, being Brizzy based, would you buy in the previous precedents for flood levels? There's some bar- there's some bargains. There to is be some had. bargains, but some if, bargains. You, if you want to play, was, would you play the the the, the averages game there? Because it was what 1976 and 2011. You can look the 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 pro- look anecdotally from what I've seen and from what I've talked to people, Bryce. What what's actually happened is straight after the floods, all those property prices hit the floor. And yeah, my mate bought one. He bought one so cheap, and, and then he just went through and renovated it, and he got himself a ripper of a, of a place yeah. in Indrapilly. Yeah. Um, but it was up to the roof in water. But yeah. he said, "Well, I'm going to play the, I'm going to play. The, it's, it's it's not a one in a hundred year flood. It's a, it's a one percent chance of it happening every year. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's playing the one one percent chance of it happening every year game, and he's so far he's in well in front. Yeah, Pete, and that's and that's actually what happened. So these riverside suburbs are our premium suburbs in Brisbane, mm. and that's exactly what happened around those areas. People just got out of these properties because they got flooded and they got spooked and they mm. wanted to sell, and everyone didn't want to touch them. The brave souls that jumped in and bought them have proven to do very well because people have short memories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seven years later, whatever, yeah. now, what what's a flood? Yeah, 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 yeah. As a business, we won't buy for no. another person in a precedent flood level. Um, it's a rule we've got here. Um, but as an individual investor who's responsible for the own decision that you make, mm. um, it's interesting that you've, uh, it, that you've given that feedback. And I've got, I've got mates who've done it. I, I tell you who buys them. Mm. It's like people that own 30 properties mm. because they've experienced enough mm. and they've got enough financial uh, buffer behind yeah. them that yeah. they can weather that storm if it happens. Yeah. But for someone who's buying their first no, property or two or three, yeah. I wouldn't advise it. Correct. But for a more seasoned investor, it, yeah. it can be a great move. All right, well, um, Andrew's got a, a couple of checklists, Ben. Yes, a so, couple of great checklists for new or old properties, existing properties. So we're going to put a link to those show notes and it's an app that they can take around and have a look at. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't go so far as to call it an app, just more of a, we've simplified it back to just a checklist, yeah. okay. but it talk, talks you through and gives you pointers as to what to look for. Brilliant. And, uh, yeah, we're getting a, quite a few downloads every week. I would imagine you would, because it'd be very, very helpful for yeah. people, because they, like you said in, in when we were talking, people just go in there and they get seduced by, mm. and they've got to cut a quick 15 minute lap, so mm. at least you can bring them back to reality and go, right, make sure you've checked out this list. So yep. in the show notes, folks, a reminder, if you don't know what the show notes are, click on the photo of me and Ben. It'll appear, all the show notes will be there. All the hyperlinks will be in the show notes and you will be able to check that out. So, Now, 25 years in the game, Andrew, you've got to have a couple of funny stories. Have you got anything that comes to mind that just, you know, that, that's oh, a good a, a, and story? And the train wreck as well. Yeah, yeah the, the train, train wreck. wreck. Yeah. Ah, well, I, I've got plenty of stories, uh, inspection stories and things, but I'm not sure how many I can tell here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was the Frankston city. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah well, I am from Frankston. Um, look, yeah, just obviously there's just been a few funny funny things that have happened just to me personally doing inspections, um, like you crack a manhole open and um, and one day a rat just a dead rat just fell on me, <laughs> surrounded by a whole lot of the rat poo oh, that it must have. Oh, and then anyway, so it's fallen, it's fallen down. So I've had to sort of go to the car and get the dustpan and brush and pick it up. And I've, I've sort of put all the, this poor dead, very stiff looking rat into the dustpan and brush and got a bit of the poo off the floor and all the cocky poo and put it in there. And I sort of looked around a bit frantically and uh, right next to me, because the manhole's outside the toilet, and so I thought, oh, I could just flush him. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so I've quickly thrown the rat into the toilet and hit the flush button, closed the lid, and then I picked it back up, lifted the lid to make sure he'd gone, and he's still there. <laughs> oh, no, no, that was a mess. <laughs> so what I had now, sorry, but oh, I had, is this story going too long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I had, this is what I want to have. We feel the like part. That we're there with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here I am. I'm now looking because the rat won't go down because he's not. He's not sort of. Yeah, he's stiff. He's stiff. He's stiff. He's stiff. So he doesn't want to go down the S bin. So he's a bit stiff. So then what I had to do is I had to pick him up. You see the look on your wife's face right now. She and said, this is new information. So I had to, anyway, to cut a long story short, I had to fish him out of the toilet yeah, and dispose yeah. of him by other means. So yeah, yeah. That was an unpleasant thing. So yeah, yeah I've had. 
had a few different run-ins and scrapes with snakes and finding stashes of you know marijuana growing and oh, really? um, yeah, yeah, firearms yeah. and uh, yeah stashes yeah. of cash in the roof cash yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you found over $1, no it was actually over two thousand oh, okay. so yeah. I did one inspection the old lady was throwing, oh no worries throwing money free love. I got it <laughs> oh, so you can have this one <laughs> for a couple of minutes I feel like so, I'm in front. No, was it old money? Like, was it the old currency that had been changed? Was or was it plastic? Or there's, was it... there's a bit of old, bit of new, oh, and okay. the rats had, the rats will eat plastic money. I've found, I've oh, learnt that. Okay. So yeah, they must get hungry. Yeah, wow. it's only fifty cents now. It used to be a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dollar note, it's only fifty cents. Um, yep. Oh, that's some fun stories. I thought we'd finish on a bit of. Yeah, I think it's terrific. But uh, I think um, what what I'd say to anyone who's uh, been listening to this for the last forty five minutes or so, um, the book building success. I gave one to each and every one of our team here, Ben, because. Great. The framework um, that that Andrew has gone through is very very good, and yeah. so if you're if you're you know if you just listen to this and you've gone wow there's so much to know just get your hands on the book because it's actually something that you can create a framework from the, just the subheadings Ben yep and then when you walk into the next property you can just do a little tick 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 make sure you're following because there Perfect. is a, there is a lot to cover but it's a very very good way for you to um, uh, if you feel like you're a, a, an amateur at um, everything building and um, if you need a building and pest inspector up in uh, Brisbane yep. and Sunshine and Gold Coast area we'll have those well, details there as well in yeah the you can reach out to Andrew from the show notes um, as well um, a quick plug the name of the business Building Pro. Yeah. Building Pro. And you've got a team of six. Team and of you, six. Uh, how, how, how north do you go? Noosa? Oh, we go as far as Noosa. And yeah. south, down to the border? Just yeah. Harvey Bay. Yeah, go down to the border. And if, yeah. <laughs> and, if, and if you want lunch, you'll go down to uh, Byron Bay as well. Just yep. to, uh, <laughs> we'll go to Byron and I'll take my yoga pants. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You go and get some vegan lunch there. So, um, Terrific. We, well, we certainly appreciate you uh, coming in today. I think, um, Ben, I think if the listeners don't get some value out yep. of that um, Great in terms of their next property, hopefully they're going this weekend that they can apply that. Um, for me, Ben, life hack. Life hack. Let's uh, go. This is for my. This is just a shout out to my food allergy friends that yes. are listening to this. Um, All those just, people uh, live in Byron. <laughs> <laughs> this is cue your gags come on mate Let, get them off your chest come no, on, no, come on. so uh i'm i've got uh heaps of food allergies right so i'm gluten free i'm dairy free i'm refined sugar free all those sorts of stuff but uh, I, I fly a lot and going through the airports of australia doesn't really cater for me much you know gluten free options so i tend to bring my own but uh for the folks who are like me, who are flying, the lawn flying, you, go, <laughs> See, I, you couldn't help yourself, could you? I, I gave it, to, I gave oh, it yeah, a run up. You didn't want it, but then yeah. you had to go in. So, but, but at the international airport, in, I'm just talking about here in Melbourne, Ben, yes. they've got this cafe and it's got heaps of grass, Ben. There's, there's, there's <laughs> grass in a cup, there's grass in the sauce, so there's grass everywhere, and it just caters for me. So I'm just, just sending it a little shout out. If you're domestic in Melbourne, just sneak over to the international section, go to the little cafe there. I'm not going to give them a full plug, Ben. I have to work that out, but that's where I go. I go and get all my stuff, load myself up, and I can travel through the airport. So that's my life hack today, Ben. Very good, very good. Did you know? Did you know? Well, I, do you know I'm, what? I'm a bit I'm, late to the party. I've got to say, I threw to you, did you know, thinking you'd just have this look on your face. <laughs> where you go, oh, no. no. Iris just got onto me early. Iris, so what are you doing? I'm a bit late to the party because obviously we had, you know, um, the demographer on recently around sort of population Mark growth. And we talked yep. about 25 million. Yep. So, so that was on the 8th of August. But I thought we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into the population story for Australia, given that we've clicked over. So our good friends at uh, ID, which mm -hmm. is basically the, pe the population experts, they've just done a little bit of analysis on our population. So I thought I'd share a bit of that. So 66% of our population growth has occurred in the last 30 years. Okay, wow. so, our, our, okay. so, and think, so I'm gonna, our, we hit 24 million in January of 2016. So it took us seven, sorry, 2.7 years to add an additional million people. Do we need to sit down for this? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> we're getting there. The previous million took us 3.1 years. Yeah. So our growth rate, our population mm -hmm. growth rate is growing at 1.6%. So we've got a very, very mm -hmm. strong population growth. So if that was to continue, and obviously this compounding nature here, to get to 70 million, it'll basically only take a year before we get another million people. So if you think about that, that's how quickly it's coming down. So it's coming down slow, uh, quicker and quicker in terms of our next million people mm -hmm. that are coming through. So I thought I'd share that with you. We're the 53rd uh, largest population country, nation in the world, okay? But we're the sixth largest land mass. Ooh. 
So we've still got yeah. a little bit of population growth to happen. What's the other five? <laughs> yeah, uh, Americans, Russia, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, all of the uh, all of the ones that start in A and end in A, um, and then the Europe as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, um, seventy percent of our population are in our largest five cities. Oh, mate. Okay, and forty percent of that seventy percent are in our two biggest cities. Drop the mic. That was there's, awesome, there's mate. That was a four page of notes. So I'm four page of notes. <laughs> Scribbled <laughs> everywhere in you know thirty seconds of quickly dropping them down, but we got there. Nice work. I didn't know that, mate. So uh, hopefully our listeners did got you know about it rather. But um, thanks again, yes. Andrew. Thank you, thank you thanks. Andrew. Pleasure thanks to have you on. And um, as I said, reach out to Andrew via the show notes, and uh, he'd be uh, more than happy to help you out if you're looking for a. Uh, uh, a building inspection up there in Bris Vegas and, and surrounding spots. But um, mate, until next week, knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. See you next week, folks.